Hello once again. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, a topic we have always we've been talking about for quite some time today, uh, for some, quite some time, and that topic is genetics. We'll still be looking at genetics. Um, we've said so much, one or two things about genetics. I think we've also looked at the definition of genetics. We've looked at um, the founder, or you can call him the father of genetics, and that is Gregor Mendel. And I also remember we have also discussed um, um, Gregor Mendel's experiments. And I told you that um, it, it is in two broad uh, groups. We have the um, uh, monohybrid inheritance, that's the experiment on monohybrid inheritance, and we have the experiment on dihybrid inheritance. And today we're going to be talking about something quite different. Um, we're going to be looking at, let's call it genetics three, part three of genetics. And um, we're going to be talking about things like back cross and test cross. We're going to see what a back cross simply means. And we're also going to look at what a test cross is all about. We're also going to be talking about what we call the principle of incomplete dominance. The principle of incomplete dominance. And also we're going to be looking at determination of sex in humans. That is how to determine the sex of a child. And we're also going to be discussing on the topic chromosomes. We're going to talk about chromosomes. And these are the areas we're actually going to be looking at in this aspect of genetics. Now, as our specific objective, by the end of this particular class, you should be able to explain briefly the process of back cross or test cross. You should be able to explain back cross or test cross. Also, you should be able to explain the principle of incomplete dominance. Should be able to explain the principle of incomplete dominance. And also, briefly, you should be able to explain the determination of sex in humans and also describe the structure of the DNA and tell us one or two things about the human chromosome or about chromosomes, okay? So these are the areas we're expecting, or I especially is expecting you to be uh, um, able to um, explain or able to deliver by the end of this class on genetics. Now, if you are set, let's begin the topic on back cross and test cross. Back cross and test cross. Now, um, if you could remember vividly, we said for um, an offspring to be produced, there must be a crossing between their genes, or there must be a cross between the genes of the of of the both parents because we're actually talking about sexual reproduction. So there must be a cross between the genes of both parents in order to result in an offspring. Now, what actually is back cross? Back cross is the crossing of an organism with the homozygous recessive organism from the original parent generation or parental generation. Now, what do we mean by homozygous recessive? I told you that a homozygous recessive is usually um, 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 indicated in genetics as the small letters, okay? While the one that is actually dominant is located or is indicated as is indicated with a capital letter. So once when you say something is a back cross, a back cross is crossing an organism, it can be a resulting offspring with the homozygous recessive of the original parental generation. Okay? Now, if you take a look at that um, 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 presentation there on the screen, you're going to see what a back cross is. Now, we have a parent which is big T, big T, that's dominant, homozygous dominant organism, crossing with a homozygous recessive. Now, when they cross, they give rise to a big T, small T. And I told you, if big T represents a tall plant and small T represents a short plant, once you have a, 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 an offspring that has 
the alleles as big T, small t. That is what we call a heterozygous dominant organism. It simply means that that particular organism is tall, having the trace or having a gene of shortness inside, which is hidden, okay, which is actually hidden. It is recessive, hidden inside. Now, if you see the, uh, that's in the first filial generation. Now, where does back cross come into? Back cross comes in when that um, um, F1 generation is now crossed with the original parental generation, the homozygous recessive. And that homozygous recessive is small t, small t. Now, you can see in F2, small t, uh, big t, small t, which is heterozygous dominant plant or organism is crossing with a homozygous recessive organism. So once you see that happen, that is what we call a back cross. We call that back cross. Now, what is test cross? Test cross and back cross are almost similar. In fact, they are the same. Now, a test cross is the crossing of an organism with the homozygous recessive organism. Just the same thing we have said. So please take note that when a when a resulting of, um, resulting offspring is crossing with a homozygous recessive organism, we refer to that in genetics as a back cross. We refer to it as back cross. Now, test cross and back cross can be used to determine, that's one of the importance, it can be used to determine the genotype of organisms showing dominant phenotype. Remember what we talked about genotype and phenotype. We said genotype has to do with the genetic constitution of an organism, while the phenotype is the expressed features, the expression that you see from the genotype. For instance, if we have big T, big T, that is the genotype. That big T, big T symbolizes tall plant. Now, tall plant is what you see. So that tall plant is what we call the phenotype. So a test cross and back cross can be used to determine the genotype of an organism showing dominant phenotype. Now, an instance can be given as this. Now, both test cross and um, back cross can be used to determine the genotype in F2 generation in which the phenotype is the same. Now, if the phenotype is the same, for instance, if we have big T, big T, and big T, small t, that is a, a, a homozygous dominant plant, and then we also have a heterozygous dominant plant. Of course, both plants, they have different genotype, but they can show the same phenotype. The big T, big T is tall plant, is a tall plant symbolizes a tall plant. The phenotype is tall. But big T, small t, the phenotype is also tall. Despite that there is a, 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 a short a, a gene or a short gene inside of it. That's why we call it heterozygous. The other is referred to as homozygous. So despite that they have the same phenotype, you can d tell or determine the genotype using back cross or test cross. You can actually determine the actual uh, uh, genotype of that of these organisms that have the same phenotype using back cross or test cross. Example is this. Now, if the phenotype of the F2 generation is a tall plant, of course, I have just explained this, that's tall, big T, uh, big, big T, big T, or big T, small T. Now, to determine the genotype of the plant, we then cross that tall plant which we don't know the genotype, we cross that tall plant with a homozygous recessive. We cross it with a homozygous recessive. Now, if the tall plant is a homozygous dominant big T, big T, when crossed with a homozygous recessive short plant, all the resulting plants will be heterozygous dominant tall plants. That's the truth. So if we cross it, this is what it will give us. That is it. That this proves that the, 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 the organism that crossed with the homozygous recessive short plant has a homozygous dominant plant or is a homozygous dominant plant. But if the uh, resulting offspring, when they are crossed, 
gives rise to um, a, 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 a kind of, you have a, 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 a ratio of big T and small t, or big T, small t, heterozygous and uh, heterozygous dominant plant, and you also have a um, homozygous recessive short plant in the offspring, it means that the organism that crossed or that did a back cross with the homozygous recessive plant is what a heterozygous dominant plant now this is what i simply mean you can see that on the screen now also if the top plant is heterozygous dominant plant when crossed with a homozygous recessive short plant the resulting plants will be both what uh, 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 you see a tall plant and then you will also see a what a short plant and they are both heterozygous dominant plants and then will also have homozygous recessive short plants so that is how to differentiate which organism has a particular genotype so we use back cross and test cross to differentiate the two the two of them okay so that is what we call back cross that's what we call back cross as well as test cross all right now the next thing we're going to be looking at after apart from back cross and test cross we will be talking about the principle of incomplete dominance the principle of incomplete dominance now if you check our previous videos on um, Mendel's experiment you will agree with me that Mendel's experiment agrees with the principle of complete dominance Mendel's experiment is on the principle of complete dominance it is not in the principle it does not explain the principles of incomplete dominance now what do we mean by the principles of complete dominance for let's take an instance let's say a red flower crossing with a yellow or a white flower now of course when the two crosses the the, the resulting offsprings will always be red or white red or white they can't be any other color but in terms of the principles of incomplete dominance there is actually a different expression when mendel did his own experiment using monohybrid inheritance and in the second one the dihybrid inheritance you could see that these were all played out for instance when he did the cross first uh, let me use monohybrid inheritance he took a plant that has a tall plant and crossed it with a short plant when they crossed the first filial generation were all tall plants now when those uh, first filial generation that were all tall plants were self um, pollinated and they crossed themselves the resulting offsprings were um, tall and short plants in the ratio of 3 is to 1 that is the genotypic sorry the phenotypic ratio was 3 is to 1 so they were all tall some of, some of them were tall and some of them were short. That was Mendel's experiment. But in this case, we will be seeing a different principle, and that is the principle of incomplete dominance. Now, the principle of incomplete dominance is actually a condition in which two contrasting alleles cross and produce a heterozygous phenotype that is different from the two homozygous phenotype. It is different from the two homozygous phenotype, unlike what we have seen in Mendel's work and experiment. It is unlike it. So a, a different phenotype emerges in principle of incomplete domin dominance. An instance can be given as this. Now, a, when there are some cases or there are some organisms or plants when a pure breeding red flower is crossed with a pure breeding white flower. Of course, by Mendel's experiment, it is supposed to give us all the resulting plants are supposed to be what? Red. That is the principle of incomplete, or, oh, sorry, principle of complete dominance. But in this case, in the principle of incomplete dominance, when a pure breeding red flower plant crosses with a pure breeding white um, plant, it will no longer produce or it will not produce a red plant, it will rather produce a pink flowered plant. 
a pink flowered plant instead of a red flowered plant. Now, once you see this type of condition, it, this condition is actually called the principle of incomplete dominance. This is the principle of incomplete dominance. Now, there are some organisms that actually undergo this principle of incomplete dominance. An example of organisms that undergo the principle of incomplete dominance include, we have what we call the Mirabilis jalapa plant. Mirabilis jalapa plant, we have the four o'clock plant, and we also have the Onlucian fowl. The Onlucian fowl, a four o'clock plant, Mirabilis jalapa, they are all examples of organisms that undergo the principles of incomplete dominance. Now, please take note. Not all organisms undergo the principle of complete dominance. There are some other organisms that undergo the principle of incomplete dominance. So this is the principle of incomplete dominance that does not flow with Mendel's experiment. Next, we are going to be looking at is determination of sex in humans. Determination of sex in humans. I believe most of you have seen a situation where a woman might, um, actually a woman is pregnant and um, most times uh, they, they don't actually know um, what sex or the sex of the child they are carrying in their womb is. And um, genetically, we are, uh, yes, genetics, we can use, we, there is a way we can actually um, um, tell um, uh, a male from a female. Now, in humans, there are about 23 pairs of chromosomes. 23 pairs. And please take note that the chromosomes in organisms are always constant. Chromosomes in organisms are always constant. And in man, we have about 23 pairs. In subsequent classes or still in this, um, this thing, we're going to be talking about chromosomes. And I'm going to show you some other, um, the number of chromosomes in other organisms. But please take note of this. In humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. So if there are 23 pairs, it means that they are 46 in number. Now, out of these 23 pairs, 22 pairs are called autosomes. They are called autosomes and they have no link. They have no um, 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 alignment or link to sex, to determination of sex. Out of the 23, 22 pairs are called autosomes while only one pair is called the sex chromosome. So one pair out of the 23 pairs of chromosome determines the sex in humans, it determines sex in humans. Now in male, this one pair of chromosomes are called X and Y chromosomes. But in female, they are called the X chromosomes. So in male, if you look at the genotype, um, um, the genotype of a male, okay, genotype of a male, it is XY, but in terms of a female, it is XX. So the chromosomes in female, they are XX, but that of a male is XY. Now, how does this determine the sex of a child or the sex of a child, mostly in humans? Now, during biological intimacy, um, during biological intimacy, actually, um, the male releases his sperm cells, which contains, and each of these sperm cells, they contain either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So the male releases his uh, sperm cells containing the X chromosomes, and once this um, 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 male sex cell that contains the X chromosome fuses with the egg of the female which contains the X chromosome. Once the fusion happens, the resulting zygote is going to be XX. I hope you understand. It's going to be XX. So if the male releases a sperm cell and that sperm cell contains an X chromosome and the female which is constant contains X chromosome, once fusion takes place or fertilization takes place, it is going to result in a female child or a female offspring will be born. But in other ways, 
during biological intimacy, if a, the sperm cell that is being released by the male contains an, or contains the Y chromosome and it fertilizes the female egg which already contains the X chromosome, it will give rise to an offspring that has the XY chromosome. And an offspring with the XY chromosome is a male. So this is how a male is being determined using or a male can be determined and then also a female child can be determined mostly in humans mostly in humans so please take note we have the xx chromosomes which is found mostly in females and then we have the xy chromosome which is found in males so this is how we determine um we determine the sex of a child mostly in males you can see that on the screen we have the father which is xy and we have the mother which is xx when they give rise to a child if the x chromosome from the father unites with that of the mother it will result in a daughter okay or a female child and then the same happens if it is x and y it will result in a male child now, the next thing we're going to be looking at in this particular topic again is chromosomes. Chromosomes. Now, what are chromosomes? You've heard so much about this word chromosomes. If you, if you take your mind back to our videos we did on cells, we talked about chromosomes. We said they are located within the nucleus of a cell. So, but what are chromosomes? Chromosomes are actually thread-like bodies that are found in the nucleus of the cell. They are found in the nucleus of the cell. Now, chromosomes contain a very important material which we call genes. And of course, you know that genes are actually responsible for the transmission of characters from parents to their what? Offsprings. They are hereditary materials. Okay, they are responsible for the transmission of characters from parents to their offspring. So every of your character is encoded and yes, is actually encoded inside of the gene. And the gene is located inside of the chromosome. The chromosomes are located inside of the nucleus and the nucleus is found inside of the cell. All right. Now, what is the appearance of the chromosomes? Now, chromosomes can be seen through a microscopic, uh, through a microscope during cell division. If you, you can't just stay and say you can see um, your chromosomes, no, no. And it is actually difficult to see a chromosome when the cell is not actually undergoing cell division. They are, when they are not undergoing cell division, it is actually difficult to see a chromosome. Now, the chromosomes, they appear at the beginning of cell division as a long slender thread. Long slender threads. Now, as cell division progresses, they become shortened and thicker. They become shortened and thicker. If you go to our videos on mitosis and meiosis, I explain this more during cell, I explain more, I have explained much on cell division, the processes or the stages of cell division. So as the cell divides or cell division progresses, the uh, um, chromosomes which appear as long slender threads become shortened and they become thicker. Now, after some time, it is observed to be made up of two threads. And these two threads are called chromatids. They are called chromatids and they are held together or they are tied together so, uh, to, so to say they are tied together at what we uh, a center called the word centroma so after sometimes it is observed to be made up of two threads called chromatids held together at the centroma as you can see there on the screen that is how it appears this is how it appears when it, the cell starts dividing. Now, after some time, you now start seeing the chromosomes appear in this form. So the center there is what we call the centroma. So each of these threads, short and thickened threads, they are referred to as the chromatids. Now, the number of chromosomes. How many chromosomes do we have in the body? Now, remember I told you something very important. I said that chromosomes are constant. Chromosomes are constant. In, most, in fact, in all organisms, chromosomes are constant. 
they don't vary. Now, the number of chromosomes in a body cell known, cell known as the diploid number is the double, is the double, is double the number of chromosomes in the gametes. Please note this, very important. The number of chromosomes inside of the body is different, is the same in the body, but in the gametes it is halved. Now we call that haploid number. Like for, let me give an instance. If um, the, the number of chromosomes in our body is 23 pairs, which is 46, like I told you in man, it is not the total number of chromosomes in man is 46. But inside of the gametes, that is gametes, we have the male gametes and we have the female gametes. In the male gametes, it is not, please note, it is not 46. It is halved. We call that a haploid number. Now, that haploid number, you divide the 46 by 2. So it is 23 in the gametes, but in the body as a whole, it is 46. Now, the reason why it is 23 in the gamete is that it undergoes what we call meiotic cell division. It undergoes meiotic cell division. So let's take a look at some examples of the number of chromosomes in some organisms. Number one, we have in dogs. Dogs, they have 26 pairs of chromosomes. And that simply means a total number of 56 chromosomes in dogs. In man, like we said before, man has a total of 23 pairs of chromosomes, which makes a total number of 46 chromosomes that is found in man. In cats, cats have um, 19, 19 pairs of chromosomes, and that makes a total of 38 chromosomes in cats. In domestic fowl, we have nine pairs of chromosomes, nine pairs. And of course, that makes a total of 18 chromosomes in domestic fowl. In garden pea plants, we have seven pairs. So also take note that um, we, we, we also have chromosomes in plants. So in garden pea plants, we have seven pairs of chromosomes, which makes a total of um, 14 chromosomes. In maize, we have 10 pairs of chromosomes, which makes a total of 20 uh, uh, chromosomes. And then in housefly, there are six pairs of chromosomes, which makes a total of 12 chromosomes. And then in fruit fly, we have um, four pairs of chromosomes, which makes also a total of eight chromosomes. So these are the number of chromosomes that are found in living organisms. And please remember again that the number of chromosomes in living organisms are constant. They are constant. Now, look at the structure. Remember, we talked about genes. We said um, genes are located inside of the chromosomes. Now, the genes, they contain what we call DNA. The genes contain what we call DNA. Now, what is DNA? It simply means deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid. So that is what we call as the full meaning of DNA. Like I said before, the DNA is located within the genes. Okay, is located within the genes and the genes is found in the chromosomes and the chromosomes is also located in the nucleus of a cell. Now, please take note of this. DNA, they store hereditary traits or materials. They store hereditary traits and they direct the metabolic activities of each cell in an organism. So these are one of the major functions of um, the DNA. As you can see, the, the structure of the DNA, it is called a helix. We have them helical. Now, DNA consists of two helical chains. Now, these chains are called around each other to form what we call a double helix. As you can see in the screen, they form what we call a double helix. Now, each helical chain consists of repeating units of nucleotides repeating units of nucleotides. Now, these nucleotides, they consist of uh, three things, three materials. One, they consist of what we call deoxyribose sugar. 
it consists of a phosphate group and then it also consists of organic nitrogen compound. Now, these organic nitrogen compounds, they include the adenine, it includes the guanine, it includes the cytosine, and then we have the diamine. These are four important nitrogen compounds that are found in the nucleotide of the DNA. Now, the, it's also important to understand that the two helical chains in a DNA, they are actually held together by a hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bond holds the two helical chains of the DNA. But this hydrogen bond usually exists between these nitrogen compounds that have just been mentioned. Now, uh, 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 in, in a way, it actually makes us understand that there is a kind of pairing that occurs between these compounds. So the, 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 the pairing establishes a bond or establishes the hydrogen bond which helps this um, the helical chain in a DNA to be held together. Now please take note, guanine always pairs with cytosine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine and then adenine pairs with what? Diamine. So that is where the hydrogen bond exists between the pairing of these nitrogen compounds. Okay, so that is all you need to know for now about the DNA. Now, another thing again to talk about is the process of transmission of hereditary characteristics. Now, what do we mean by this? How um, hereditary traits are being transmitted from parents to offspring? How are they transmitted? Now, the first process is that the chromosomes which carry these genes, they pass into the gametes during meiosis. During meiosis. Now, during the, also you should remember that in meiosis, there are two important stages or two important, yes, stages of cell division. While in mitosis, it involves only one cell process or one stage of cell division, but in meiosis, it is two. Now, during the first cell division of meiosis, the homologous chromosomes, they separate into two daughter cells, which of course you know. Then in the second division or cell division, you now have four daughter cells. That is why in meiosis, four daughter cells are produced, but in mitosis, two daughter cells are usually produced. So in the first cell division of meiosis, the homologous chromosomes, they separate into two daughter cells. Now in the second cell division, the two chromatids, okay, in each chromosome separate. Now, this brings about separation of genes. That's what we call separation of genes. Now, each gamete can contain only one gene for one of a pair of contrasting character. And then the fourth thing that happened is that after fertilization or at fertilization, that is after the, when the male gamete and the female gamete are being released and fertilization or fusion takes place, or fertilization takes place, the gametes diffuse during fertilization. Now, the zygote receives two genes for the same character. One, that it receives two genes for the same character. That is, it receives from the parent, and then it also receives, sorry, it receives one from the father and also receives from the mother. Now, one chromosome in the egg from the parent and the other one in the chromosomes from the uh, sperm of the male or the male parent. So it receives from both of them. But please take note, it is two genes that are being infused into the zygote. Remember? So then the next thing that happens is that if the two genes are the same, that is the one that the, the zygote gets from the father and also from the mother, if they are the same, the offspring will now be homozygous. But if they are not the same, the offspring will now be heterozygous. I'll give an instance. Now, if let's say this is a tall plant and also another tall plant, they cross. <clears throat> what the child gets from the mother, if the mother is tall, will get a tall gene. 
and if it is from the father it will also get a tall gene now it simply means that that child will now have a homozygous dominant that is big t big t but if the mother is short and then the father is tall the father produces the gene which is uh, in, in, in the constitution if we are to put it out in latest it now becomes capital letter t and that from the mother which is short is small letter t what the child gets it's a heterozygous okay heterozygous in the sense that they don't have the same allele they don't have the same gene all right now a gene please take note directs the formation of a protein usually an enzyme which affects the formation of cell products that bring about the expression of a character so these the, these genes when they get into the child or the zygote when the zygote or the, the zygote now develops into an embryo from an embryo develops into um a fetus and then is delivered now the expression of character is directed by the gene the child has actually received from their parents so this is how chromosomes are being transmitted from parents or genes per se are being transmitted from parents to their offspring this is where we call it a wrap-up in this particular class on genetics i hope you enjoyed the class but before we go i'd like us to look at some few questions using our exam guide app few questions very few um let's look at some of them here um look at the first one they said which of the following statement is correct about the structure of a chromosome we've talked about the structure of a chromosome and they said a chromosome consists of a is it two chromatids at the spindle that's not correct b they said two chromatin threads joined at the centrals we never mentioned that c said threads like structures not joined together and then d says two chromatid joined at the centroma Remember when we were talking about um, the chromosomes, the appearance of the chromosome, I told you that you might not be able to see the chromosome even if you use a microscope. It is during cell division, the, 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 the chromosome, first of all, appears as a long, a, a long slender thread, thread-like structure, which then becomes shortened and thicker as the cell division continues. And it appears as two short threads that are joined together at the centroma. So it means that the correct answer to this particular question is option D. Option D is correct. Look at question two. They said in dihybrid inheritance, that talks about Mendel's work, Mendel considered, of course, in dihybrid inheritance, he considered two pairs of contrasting alleles. But in monohybrid inheritance, he cons considered only a pair of contrasting character now let's move to the next one question three look at this question they said an apple plant can produce sexually and asexually and it has 40 chromosomes in its leaf cell how many chromosomes will be in each gamete remember i told you that what is in the gamete is half the total number of chromosome and what is in the somatic cell somatic cells are, are, are products of 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 um or what goes on in the somatic cell the cell division that goes on in somatic cell is mitosis and in mitosis we have diploid number of chromosomes. It simply means that the, the same number of chromosomes in the parent is also the same number of chromosomes in the somatic cell. Then if it is in the gametes, it is haploid. Please take note. When it is in the gamete, in fact, the gamete is the only place you see haploid number of chromosomes. Every other part of the body cells they are what deployed please don't forget this they are all deployed now take a look at it now they said in the apple plant it has 40 chromosomes it means in the somatic cell it will still be what 40 but in the gamete it will now be what 20 please note 
because in the gametes it is haploid but in the somatic cell it is still what diploid so the correct answer you can see there is c c simply says 20 chromosomes in the gametes and then 40 chromosomes in the somatic cell all right then look at this one they said a man with blood group a is married to a woman with blood group ao now the blood group of their son is likely to be the blood group of their son is likely to be a yes that's correct it's likely to be a how is it so when this man with aa crosses or yes crosses with a woman with ao when they cross, you have resulting offsprings are AA, AO, AA, AO. So there is no O. Now, O here in this case is recessive. It is not dominant. What is dominant here is the A. Okay? So what you see is the child has blood group A. Next, they said, according to Mendel's law, First law of inheritance, segregation of genes occur when tall plants are crossbred. No, it's when tall plants and short plants are crossbred. Um, there's something I'm looking for. How many chromosomes will be in a gamete if the normal cell has four chromosomes? Of course, if the normal cell has four chromosomes in a gamete, it will be half of this. And so the correct answer is two. Let's take this as our final question. Um, if a person has two alleles of sickle cell anemia, the person has the disease, yes. Now, if the person has two alleles of sickle cell, it means the person is SS and not AS. And someone that is SS simply means the person has the disease okay and the person is sick but if it is as is a carrier but might not show symptoms of sickle cell because the s which is the sickle cell is recessive but if it is aa it means that the person is not a carrier and is also perfectly healthy okay so this is where we call it a wrap up on this class i'll see you in our next class bye for now